our first case just last week and over the weekend there's been two more cases and so we're up to three cases right now and they've started doing some limited vaccination mostly out of health care facilities and it hasn't got to the point where we'd be doing any kind of mass vaccination at this point and just today the CDC set up a series for the next three weeks to have meetings with local health and state health to kind of just provide guidance if you will so we'll have one starting this week one of the things another thing that kind of took up a fair amount of our time is we had the Western Connecticut State University tick-borne disease prevention laboratory received a bunch of samples that were on a pet of a Fairfield resident down the beach area that had dozens of ticks on them and so they tested the ticks and it came turned out to be the Asian longhorn tick which is a which is a newer tick to the area I mean it's been around for a few years 2018 I think was it was when they first started identifying and then they did some historical research and looking back at samples and ticks that were misidentified they said they think it's been here since 2010 in the United States. Is it small like a deer tick or big like a dog tick? It's smaller on the smaller side yes smaller like a deer tick and so the so they found a bunch of these ticks down in the beach area and on this dog and then they asked if they got permission to come back and do some sampling surveillance sampling in the beach area and so we worked with the town attorney and the first elections office to get approval for them to come through on town property and they did you know essentially it's dragging like a felt type cloth across the ground and along bushes and along the edges of you know the Penfield auxiliary parking lots across the street some along the Jennings Beach sort of where the parking lot meets the walkover bridges sort of that edge there and then around the edge of where the Santa Castle playground is and they found lots of ticks and so it's just indicative that this tick is now established in this area and so the concern related to this tick is not necessarily it doesn't cause human or animal disease at this point in the United States it's capable in other countries it transmits disease but they haven't found that here yet and and it's more likely to be the disease that they carry is typical affects livestock so it's it's right now not a concern for people and pets but the concern is this this tick the unique part of this tick is that the female can reproduce asexually and essentially clone themselves and so what happens is these ticks multiply very rapidly and so you can have it's 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 not uncommon to have you know a dog that brushes up upon it to get hundreds of ticks on them at the right time you know when when these are hatching and 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 so so that that's a concern you know people will be concerned about seeing that so we did put out a press release related to that we they gave us some some guidance that we gave to the Parks Department and Public Works and Conservation and they've already gone out and done some trimming back in those areas to get the bushes and overgrowth away from sidewalks and walking paths and you know just further away from where people might come in contact with just branches or leaves kind of brushing up against people. Do you have any kind of disease in other countries that we've... Yes, yes. So it's only on livestock. No, no. It transmits disease in Australia where it's been established for a long time so it's it's a competent vector for disease it's just disease hasn't been established in the ticks and they're you know in other countries it's a competent vector for disease so in you know in I think it's Japan and Australia it transmits human disease. So we know if the existing deer tick that does carry disease here for us can transmit to this tick? So that you know from what I remember the conversation I have with her that it doesn't appear to be a competent vector for Lyme. It wasn't great in a laboratory setting but that's not necessarily what happens in you know in nature. So but don't quote me on that. You know I you know it's I had a series of conversations with Dr. Connolly who's 
up at uh, Western Connecticut State University. Um, and they're going to come back through the summer and, uh, and do additional surveillance testing. They're going to send some of the ticks out to see if they uh, contain disease. And if they contain disease, it doesn't necessarily mean that they transmit it, you know. Um, so, but it's a, it's a new thing here. We went back through our, uh, you know, the, the concern is not necessarily the presence of the tick. It's been around the area that have been identified in Connecticut. We've had since September 21, six individual uh, tick samples come back with this tick. But the thing that's different is that just, you know, this, this pet had lots of ticks on it and they have confirmed that it's well established in this area. <coughs> And it's really the you know the same tick prevention strategies as other ticks that you would employ of just you know putting on repellent if you're going to be out in areas where you're going to brush up against it. Um, you know it doesn't. Uh, from what Dr. Connolly said, it, it wouldn't be like on the beach itself, but it may need be near the, uh, if you're by the edge by the dunes. It's capable of being there, but it likes sort of the wetter, grassier uh, areas uh, where it doesn't uh, where it can survive better. So that that was a you know a uh, uh, couple of weeks worth of work this uh, this past month um, of just getting the word out and Santina's done a series of posts since then about tick farm prevention. We actually uh, did the press release and we circulated it through the Fairfield Beach the two Fairfield Beach homeowners associations to get the word out there, and so and it did get picked up by uh, Connecticut wide press. Uh, Channel 12, uh, I think it was NBC, Connecticut, I picked it up. And so it kind of the word got out, you know, like later the following week I had a meeting with the commissioner and uh, and, the, and the other directors of health and they all knew about it. They all asked me questions. So has it been in other towns and the shoreline towns? Up, yeah. Up the coast? Yeah. yeah, it's, it's been in other towns and it's, it's been here. You know, this is the first sort of uh, significant finding of a, of a population sort of sporadic ticks here and there right. have been found. Uh, but they, they, you know, said, we're just waiting for this to happen, you know, and it, it doesn't mean that it's not in other areas. We just haven't found a place where they've reproduced in significant right. numbers like this. Um, so, mm -hmm. so we'll continue to work with, uh, you know, Parks and Conservation Department, uh, you know, when they do any, uh, if they employ any additional uh, remediation strategies, they, the, uh, the lab will come out and wants to do some research and serve some effectiveness of that. So uh, we'll continue to work with them throughout the summer and fall. Um, and uh, as we were discussing a little before the meeting, we've seen a lot of increase in activity of rodent activity going on in town. So, uh, you know, which uh, <coughs> last week resulted in actually uh, St. Tina and other staff going out and doing door to door in one neighborhood where there's a, a well established the grass issue. Mean. What's that? Like ra rats? Um, a lot of mice and some rats, you know, but you know, just activity where they're getting in homes and people are seeing. Well, it's funny, I was driving the other day and I totally saw a rat like cross the road and I feel like I hadn't seen that before and it did like yeah. trigger. That's, you know that's what I mean? It was a trigger. trigger I was day, like, then, there, hmm. then that means there's a, some sort of a population that's been I was like, over. ooh, this is not typical. So, so we've had a couple cases throughout the community of people saying, hey, I'm seeing, <laughs> I'm seeing road up <laughs> here, and I'm seeing yeah. road in this neighborhood, and so I mean, we're working with uh, a case in Southport. This was uh, sort of in the downtown area, um, the neighborhood where they did about, you know, 50 houses or so of handing out leaflets door to door uh, just to make people aware. And it's just basically that we've done it up behind uh, Black Rock Turnpike uh, where there's a series of restaurants and there's a neighborhood right behind it. Mm -hmm. We've done that same thing. we putting out leaflets to all the neighbors saying, hey, if you've got, if you're putting out bird feeders, if you're putting out bowls of pet food and water out, like stop for now and, mm -hmm. you know, and they'll go someplace else, you know. Um, but uh, so that same kind of thing that we put out in that neighborhood, trying to sort of collectively put some control measures in place so that they uh, go elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, so that's been uh, taking a little bit of time. In, in addition, we've uh, the, the housing and uh, blight cases have. Uh, there's been a couple uh, cases where it's uh, consumed a bit of our time in terms of uh, uh, court action uh, and just you know. Uh, 
and you know, doing a, a series of inspections. We did the house that I had mentioned mm -hmm. where we had declared it unfit for habitation last month. We were able to get, get back in there. The individual, uh, and they had cleaned up the property and we had, they were able to get back in there. The uh, homeowner was able to uh, get back in the home after he came out of the uh, unpleasant home, so, which was good. Uh, but you know, we have a series of uh, light complaints that is consuming a bit of our time in terms of just um, uh, people that have been issued citations, which is a hundred dollar a day fine, uh -huh. um, who are you know upset by that and appealing and asking for additional hearings and you know having their lawyers call us and you know trying to uh, abate in any way they can fines. You know mm -hmm. they get pretty big pretty quick. I mean one of them's. Thirteen thousand dollars right now, um, and mm -hmm. I think well the last one we paid. I remember Andrew what that was. The last one they paid was thirty something. Oh yeah, I think it was. Yeah, yeah, so, I think it was. 30. And did they actually pay it? Seven thousand. Yeah, yeah. You know, so it's it's you know. It's, are uh, you just a question on that? Is are you finding that with the way the housing market market is right now, and the fact that people can sell houses that would otherwise be less desirable that that's like impacting things at all and just like because I, I mean I feel like I've noticed certain places being cleaned up or that some plate houses that might not necessarily have been as marketable being so yeah. or is it just like these are places that there's not going to necessarily going to be a change in ownership etc. Well I think we've seen both. Mm -hmm. We've seen, we've right. seen some Turnover a series of times mm -hmm. uh, during this, where uh, developers, if you will, or you mm -hmm. know, people who like to flip houses will buy it and then realize, well, I don't want to do this, or there's so much activity going on um, mm -hmm. that they say, well, I don't want to work on this now, so I'll put it up mm -hmm. for sale. Yeah. And they don't want to do the work related to the blight, and so mm -hmm. we get to a point where, okay, now, yes, you may have been the owner for a couple of months, but we're going to have to cite you. Mm -hmm if you're just planning to leave it like this. And then we've got other owners that have have houses that are in that condition and they could care less about the fines. Yeah. You know, they'll it, it, you know, it's they don't have the money to make the repairs, uh, or they claim they don't have the money to make the repairs and Yeah, I'm surprised one of the houses in my neighborhood that's been pretty defunct for a while, yeah. they just uh, actually just re roofed and I was like, Wow, is something happening here? you know? Yeah. Um yeah. Uh, who knows? But there's so, still yeah. those places that look almost uninhabitable, not just from, not well, just from like a very mild light, but just looks like mm -hmm. the point one I had sent you, I think at one point that yeah. looked like the roof was did they, literally going to fall in. Did they put a new roof on? No, no this okay. is really another one that has like tarps yeah. over the roof and like the complete porch, everything is sunk in. Like it looks like it's yeah. going to collapse and like. Well, not even that kind of blight, but like unsafe. Yeah, just by all means, send us an email of the address. Yeah. We'll put it on the list. You know, it's, it's, but like the other one that you had mentioned, mm -hmm. you know, that's the one where they, they sold it and mm -hmm. then they're selling it again. And, mm -hmm. you know, we're probably going to have to end up site, issuing a citation on the new owner, you know, who, mm -hmm. who started to make repairs, took care of the condemnation issues, the structural right, uh, right, safe right. issues, and made it stable, but doesn't want to invest the money in. Taking care of the blight issues, you know, it's right. more the, the appearance of the house. You know, it's missing siding. It's the roof is damaged. There's a tarp. You know, and they're given a reasonable amount of time to get all this done. They are. I mean, oh, I'm sorry, you know, like money. To, when you do that, just a question: Do you um, send information about those, like um, through the housing and economic development? Do you send any information on the like single family rehabilitation yep. program? No, okay. You know, that's just in case they are yeah, aware. I mean, we make them aware of. You know, uh -huh. if, if they're communicative with us, you know, mm -hmm. we make them aware of the programs that are available through the town. A lot of them just ignore us. Because, you know, they have supplementation programs. If it's, a, if it's like a your first time homeowner, that um, <coughs> the town, if you're within a certain income bracket, you actually can get 60% of it covered by the town yeah. and 40% you have to cover. So for things that are not aesthetic, like in on the interior, but things like roofing, siding, um, that are actually like kind of a, either a safety piece or just like a house maintenance um, out exterior aesthetic piece. And it's like a really good program because it puts in 
it's like as a lien on home or if you either refinance or whatever else, but it's a really good program. I know I've known a lot of people use that because it just gave that differential where somebody who couldn't otherwise afford it was able to afford it. You know, I mean, it's a big difference. Well, it's a great program. Yeah, Mark, people come to our meetings every now and then again, you know, mm -hmm. um, as well. So, but so those have been, you know, consuming, the, we have the one where we uh, <clears throat> declared the unit to be an illegal apartment um, mm. where the individual is, you know, now in court. And so we've had hearings last week and next this week um, uh, where we're just trying to work out the logistics of it um, and, and the relocation aspect of it. So that gets complicated. But, um, and as I mentioned, we did, uh, um, I did go to the commissioner's semi-annual meeting, the two meetings a year that uh, were required to attend with the commissioner. And one of the, you know, one of the interesting graphs I'll just share you is, 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 um, was from the deputy state epidemiologist kind of showed, you know, if you look at the red, blue, red, green, and blue is sort of each year's cases and pass it down, but it kind of shows starting to establish like a, um, a seasonality to the waves, you know, and she said, you know, you can, you can see kind of what's been happening the last three years and what's had the potential to happen going forward. Um, to look at the seasonality of it, um, you know, all prefaced with COVID has <laughs> surprised us every year, and uh, mm -hmm. so it could follow a completely different pattern next year. Mm -hmm. But um, so, but it's just an interesting presentation <laughs> from the uh, the state epidemiologist and the deputy state epidemiologist about it, sort of their thoughts on it. You know, the the one quote I'll share from Dr. Carter's data be just for a long time. Um, oh, where we go? I'm trying to find this quote. Oh, I guess it printed out wrong. Well, I can't quote it because it didn't print out right. But basically it was something like, you know, pandemics come in with a bang and go out with a whimper, you know, and mm -hmm. it's like there's, it's it, it, de trying to define the end of a Thank pandemic you. is difficult. Um, you know, and uh, the struggle that he has had with COVID, you know, in terms of trying to provide guidance and advice, you know, in his role. Um, but, um, so, uh, and Bruce, I'll get to, to sort of wrapping up here. Um, we did get the MRC and the ELC grant approved by the RTM, so that's moving forward. Uh, we're working on the per capita grant application right now. Uh, and the state uh, did indicate we'll get level funding uh, there, so that's another $120,000. Um, and um, uh, we did, uh, I did meet with um, Fairfield U, uh, had like a partnership council for their um, public health program that they're, they have an undergraduate program, and they're launching a graduate program. And so we had a Zoom meeting with sort of all the regional partners to talk about it and talk about how we can sort of incorporate um, connect better with that program going forward. We've always had, you know, it's in the it's in the School of Health Sciences and the School of Nursing. We've always had a relationship with Fairfield Youth from for nurses. They've done projects for us throughout the years in a variety of different, different capacities. Um, but uh, to that, connect with the public health students coming out, and, you know, we've we've had relationships with like Southern Connecticut State University, and have had, had two of our staff, or well, one of our staff is from uh, was from Quinnipiac. Uh, their health uh, health sciences program that's now current staff started as an intern with us, um, and so at, at Southern Connecticut we've had a long relationship with hosting interns there and, and actually hiring some of them, um, and so uh, we hope to establish that relationship with Fairfield U, um, and also we'll be looking to do that with the Sacred Heart is also uh, working to establish an MPH. Mm -hmm. I think they're starting an MPH program. Um, or started it, right? They started it two years ago. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so trying to, you know, connect with them and sort of work in uh, a regular internship program, you know, hopefully a paid internship program that we can, you know, with the increased per capita funding, we can kind of probably uh, do that um, going forward. And then lastly, uh, the health department was recognized uh, at a nice ceremony, and some of you may have seen it in the select woman's email that the chamber of gave the health department, and the uh, uh, several departments of the town recognized the town in general for their response to COVID, and so we got a nice chicken dinner up at the Patterson Club and a nice, nice uh, 
some nice kind words said to, uh, about the town and uh, and uh, and uh, uh, a nice little plaque. So, but it was a nice little thing. And so that is it for my report. Thank you very much. Guess that's me. <laughs> um, okay. So as Sam mentioned, ELC two kind of kicked in. Under ELC2, we have two part-time, um, they're called case investigators. They're actually MPH students from Sacred Heart University. They both are recent grads. Um, and we have a full-time, she's a COVID project manager. Um, and so what they're doing is they're still reaching out to positive cases, providing health education. Um, they are also working on a history, um, like archive project about COVID. So they're collecting information and photos from the very beginning to the very end. Um, and one, it's a cool historical project, but two, it's helping us to um, improve our infectious disease response. Um, and so that's kind of what we're working on now. Um, as Sans mentioned, our, our COVID work kind of helped um, towards our monkeypox response. So at this time, we are really starting to familiarize ourselves with the different contact levels. Um, we are developing a script for a positive case if we have to do some contact tracing in that um, and a script for um, any potential contacts. Um, and so just kind of getting to know the whole process with that. Um, as far as health education programming, we did Know Your Numbers with um, uh, um, town employees. Um, we did, I believe, 12 people, um, and that was completely filled in a two-hour period. So we did A1C, we did blood pressure, and we did height and weight. Um, we do not do cholesterol. Um, and so it was really informative. We had a high school intern with us, and we have um, an undergrad public health um, intern, Abby, um, and they were able to assist. And so it was, it's kind of one of those cool programs where you see, like, public health, you know. Um, so, you know, a few people with some high blood pressure, we refer them to their doctor. Um, so it was really a good program. Um, and the public health nurse and I started brainstorming, how can we go back out into the public? Um, so whether it's going to different um, public events or we even talked about maybe the second Tuesday of every month having a standalone, you know, people from the public can you know, make an appointment and then we can do their know your number. So, you know, we're trying to, those are in the preliminary discussions. If we had had this pre-COVID. Yes. We had, this was all established in ways we did this several times a year and now we're just kind of working back into it. Right? Yep. Let's do it again. Um, and then our Healthy Lifestyles, this is our 13-week um, healthy behavior change program. We'll be starting sometime in September. Um, our Diabetes uh, and Chronic Disease Support Group is currently off for the month of July and August, and this is at the Senior Center, um, but we will be starting back up in September. Um, and then our Matter Balance Program, which is our Fear of Falling Prevention Program, which was extremely popular um, pre-COVID, we're going to be bringing them back. Yes. Um, and so the Senior Center is very excited to have it back. Um, I just have to train our uh, public health nurse. So our previous public health nurse was fully trained in the program. Um, she has since abandoned us and retired. Uh, so I do have to train our new public health nurse. Um, but she is on board, and we're really excited to do that in the fall. Um, and then throughout the region, Region 1, um, which is everywhere from Greenwich up to Trumbull and kind of over to Monroe, um, we've been really working on um, increase in our social media presence and really helping people know what public health does. We're more than just COVID and flu vaccines. Um, and so we've been doing a video series. We've done something on, um, you know, safety at barbecues and um, water testing. Um, and so this month it's our turn and we're going to do something on lice. And so our public health intern is going to do a minute and a half little script on lice and the perfect for upcoming school year. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. So, um, so we'll be putting that out. Um, and, you know, our social media, we've really been focusing on um, the ticks. We've been putting a lot of information out with that. Um, a lot of information on the pediatric vaccine, uh, the six months to five years. People can't really seem to find it, so we've been putting out like, some resources like where it can be found. I did put up some information on the helmets. 
Mm -hmm. So if anyone has any other ideas, you know, please just let us know. Yep. I would say one other idea, um, just because it's come up recently, is um, life jackets. Okay. Like when you're um, a, a friend of mine lost somebody who had drowned at Candlewood um, through his workplace like uh, last month. And it was just like somebody was very experienced and on, on the boat. So I think it's just like that reminder that when you're... It's actually a really good thing. Yesterday we were just sitting at the beach mm -hmm. and there were two paddle boarders. Mm -hmm. And my husband said, they're going to get trouble. They don't have a life jacket. And I right. didn't know that that was a paddle. real thing. Even if they mm -hmm. don't wear it, they have to have it on. Well, and I'm <laughs> telling you, I've been yeah. kayaking actually a lot in Black Rock Harbor and always have the life jacket on all the time. And every now and then it's like, we'll see somebody who has it on the side or next to them or something same with on the boat it's just like the idea that you won't necessarily have the time to just like grab it put it on hook it on in that moment when something yeah. um happens so yeah. I, I would say just like keeping it on for paddle boarding kayaking um you know being on a boat like even if you're an experienced swimmer because that that person who passed away was like was a totally experienced Person and who knows? I don't think they have the information of what happened, but it's like, you know, you never know. You yeah. Have a medical episode, you could have something that just goes awry in the moment. Um, so that's something that I think is just like a good reminder. Certainly, too. I remember when my kids were younger, like on the beach. You know what I mean? Like keeping track of a lot of kids, like knowing what's Coast Guard approved. We had like those puddle jumpers, you know, that mm -hmm. were like hook on, so there's no way to really take them off. And we started putting them on all the time just in case, God forbid, you lost sight of them for even, you know, it happens every year. Fourth of July, somebody makes an announcement, has anyone seen? Um, and the kid ends up being at Sandcastle or, you know, mm -hmm. somewhere else. Like, for, you know, fortunately, most of the time it's a positive outcome, but like, I think that's a good public service Absolutely. announcement um, about like the. Coast Guard approved safety devices, or they are allowed at the beach because at one point, I don't know if you remember, but I feel like a while ago, you actually weren't supposed to have something on the, the beaches, like, because they didn't want you to be using, like, flotation things. Rely on it, yeah. Right, but now it's, like, it's kind of allowed as a, a safeguard, so I think that would be good. And, and also the fact that, like, the marina and some places actually have them. I haven't been there recently, but they at least like a couple years ago, they actually had a um, an area where you could borrow. Like they actually had mm -hmm. life jackets on display there where you could actually use and borrow them if you needed them. Like a, almost like a lending library. Mm -hmm. Check with the yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was, yeah, that was at least at the Fairfield Marina. Mm -hmm. So it would be good to see mm -hmm. if that's like up and running and restocked. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> well, if anyone ever comes up with any ideas, please just let us know. I'm always trying to... No, I'm happy about the helmet thing. And yeah. I will say, like, to piggyback on that, piggyback, <clears throat> piggyback, piggyback. <laughs> Sorry. The speech pathologist in me is like, I'm accentuating the different <laughs> syllable. Um, but I do think there should be a little reiteration as much as I think it's super awesome that they have these, like, the bird... Um, the scoot, the um, what do you call them? The electric yeah. scooter. Yeah. Um, man, these people are like flying at 25, 30 miles an hour. I've seen a lot of traumatic brain injury people, and like I, and just I think a little bit of awareness. Hey, this is awesome that this is available. My understanding is that they actually, you can actually send away or something through the app for like a free helmet. There are actually ways to get something. I mean, I don't know if there's a way to have some sort of affiliation program, but man, that's really high speed. I mean, yeah. So I'm, and that's supposed to be like 18 plus, and like it's, yeah. these are not 18 plus, like flying on them after hours, like seeing them, you know? Yeah, and don't quote me on this, yeah. but mm -hmm. um, I do sit on the bike pedestrian mm -hmm. committee, and that has been that was the discussion last month. Mm -hmm. um, and I think they were 
again, don't quote me, they were going to try to lower the speed, the max speed, to 12 yeah. miles an hour okay. because they did notice that a lot of young kids, even though they're supposed to be 18 and older, were hopping mm -hmm. on these. Um, yeah. You know, they're figuring out the system. Mm -hmm. um, and the thought was if they lower the speed, it wouldn't be as appealing to the younger kids. Mm -hmm. I don't know what happened of that. Again, that was just last month. We do have a bike pad mm -hmm. meeting. Um, and they don't use bike paths, not the sidewalks, correct? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's supposed to be in the street, not yeah. the sidewalk. So I do know that there has been some discussion um, with that group and the first select yeah. women's office. And I, and I mean, I'm all for, like, listen, not kiboshing fun, and I get how it's, like, a great mode of transportation. Like, there's a lot of really positive things about it, but um, I do think, like, just raising the awareness yep. no, in great. the town really of that, certainly decreasing the speed not only is, like, perhaps reducing the appeal, like you said, but also there would be a huge difference as far as impact from injury of like 25 miles an hour versus half the speed, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. So, <clears throat> anyway. I, having seen someone in another city mm -hmm. totally wipe out mm -hmm. on one, mm -hmm. going down a hill Ow. and hit uh, on a sidewalk, yep. hit a, a lip. You hit all you have to do is hit a little lip. And, you know, and and she was not in good shape after that. Yep. No, no, it's definitely, I mean, but again, I, I, I'm i all for like, okay, everybody has their own risk assessment, but I do think just like a little bit more yeah. um, education about safety on that, mm -hmm. what a traumatic brain injury is, and how to safeguard from that and safe rules would be probably beneficial. Yeah. Cool. Great. Thank you. Um, and then just a few more things. The other thing we're currently working on is our community health improvement plan with the Healthy Health Improvement Alliance. Um, so we should have, so every three years we do a community health needs assessment with the local hospitals and the six local health departments. Um, and then from that needs assessment, we develop a community health improvement plan mm -hmm. um, to say, like, this is what we're going to do to improve the needs of the community. Um, and so the different subcommittees have been working on this probably for the last two or three months, um, and we're just about finalized with that. And then once our plan is um, done and approved by the boards at the hospital, there will be some sort of um, public announcement and showcase of it. Typically incorporate those uh, health improvement plan goals into our strategic plan. So. The current strategic plan has them built right into mm -hmm. our, our plan. And they haven't changed um, too much. Um, and then we are um, doing a quality improvement. Um, we are working on our website. So going through our website, there is just so much information and it's not very organized. And so our um, public health intern, Abby, is going through the website and kind of trying to organize everything. Um, and so we're working on that, and hopefully that will be done um, by the summer. Um, and then, again, I'm working really closely with Bike Pet Engineering and Department of Public Works to spend our preventative health block grant money, which I think we're going to finish a sidewalk at South, South Pine Creek. So apparently there's an area where there's sidewalk, and then no sidewalk, and then it continues on again. So we're going to try to finish up that area. Um, that's pretty much it. Great. I have one quick question about the, the Know Your Numbers, which I think mm -hmm. is great. Is there, what's the mechanism by which they get, that information gets, do you rely on the, on the person to relay that information to their doctor? Or yeah. Is there, so they would, because they may, they may understand what an A1C is. Most yeah, so, too, but not yeah, so our public health nurse gives them really good in, in yeah. education on that. So each person gets a, about a 10 to 15 minute allotted time. And so everyone kind of knows what their blood pressure is, but it's right. the A1C where we have the diagram and we show them like what level they're in. And we've actually had a few people who have said, okay, and they left and they called their doctor right away. And the goal of the program, you know, the whole thing, Know Your Numbers, is about getting to understand, oh, hey, there's a couple numbers I really should right. mm -hmm. keep track of, you know, my A1C, my weight, you know, um, you know, BMI. Uh, yeah, the BMI uh, blood pressure. Blood pressure, mm -hmm. I should know those, you know, like, right. and so when you go to the doctor, and you hear them say, oh, okay, you know, you were, you know, well, you're 130 over 90, you know, and you, to know, like, oh, that's high for me, you know, like, so they recognize that, and that's part of the program, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. just great that they know that stuff, yeah. you know. 
and we write everything down for them that we tell them take it with your doctor so this way you actually see I will say like hi or you know whatever like on the cusp so. yeah. great mm -hmm. thank you yeah Good. thank you very much so were there any any communication I have none is there any old business that you guys wanted to talk about is there any new business we want to talk about. I have none. You can put in the agenda. Okay. Um, <laughs> so nothing else nothing else really wants to discuss. So it's <laughs> Great. Miracle. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. All right. No. All in favor? All in favor. Okay. And so uh, just as a reminder, we could please skip an, the August meeting, and so we'll see you in September then. Okay. Unless there's an issue coming up or uh, something that we need to resolve uh, okay. prior to the school year, you know. Um, but <laughs> please you know, say no to that. Yeah, there was a, a you know a, a mm -hmm. slight change in policy of the state uh, related to our.